seat. And let's pray again together as we come to hear from God. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for all that you've said to us already today. And we pray that you would help us to come with expectation and soft hearts again now. And I pray that this message would touch not just our minds, but deep into our hearts, and that it would change our lives. And we pray that for this whole day, that we wouldn't just be thinking about these things for the next few hours and then forget them, but these things would ring in our minds and our hearts for many days and weeks and months to come. In Jesus' name, amen. What do you do when your heart grows cold to the things that are most precious? What do you do when that happens with the cross? It may be that um, a few years ago you became a Christian, maybe for some of us longer than others, and when you were first a Christian, the death of Jesus on the cross was just so precious to you. And you love thinking about it. You love talking to other people about it. But maybe now you've been a Christian for a few years and it just doesn't quite seem as exciting anymore. And when you hear about the cross, you think, yeah, I know about the cross. I think that can be particularly a danger for us who go to evangelical churches um, I think all of us here are in churches that will call themselves evangelical, and that means that every week when you go to church, you'll be hearing about the cross. And it's absolutely right that that should be the case, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The cross is at the heart of the Christian faith. But the problem is, isn't it, with anything that you hear over and over again there's a danger that you just become a bit familiar with it. And you begin to think, I'd rather hear about something else, actually. <laughs> to hear again about the cross, again at church, just feels even a bit boring. Well, if our hearts have begun to get into that kind of state, it is a dangerous place to be. J.C. Ryle, who um, had an amazing beard, and um, who was the, uh, the first bishop of Liverpool in the 1800s, he said, when people are weary of hearing about the cross, their heart is in an unhealthy state. And Ra was someone who, he lived to be 84, and he had a very active mind. He graduated from Oxford University. He never graduated from the cross. He said, it's the one subject he could never hear too much of right to the end of his life. Well, how is it that we can be like that? If our love for the cross has grown a bit cold, what is it that will rekindle it? How can we make sure that we are still loving the cross into our 80s and beyond? Well, I hope that part of the answer will be Esther chapter 7 that we're going to look at today. Because as I've been um, studying it in preparation to come to be with you, I found that it is a great antidote for over-familiarity, that it's a chapter which rekindles our love for the cross. And it does that even though it was written 500 years before the cross actually happened. Well, how can that be? And to, to help us understand, I'm going to tell you a story. A few years ago, I went to an exhibition in London at the Wellcome Trust, which some of you might have heard of. And it was an exhibition about health. And as part of the exhibition, I watched a black and white video on something called the Peckham Project, which was an initiative in Peckham in the 1940s to help people become more healthy. As I watched this video, I suddenly started to cry. The museum attendant was extremely taken aback and did not know what to do. No one had ever cried at this video before. And it was because as I watched the video, onto the screen walked my great aunt Mary as a young woman in a doctor's coat. And at the time she was in her 90s living with my grandma. I'd never seen even a photograph of her as a young woman, let alone a video. And suddenly, totally unexpectedly, 
I was seeing her in a way I'd never seen her before. And it was unmistakably her. And I found out later she had been involved with the Peckham Project, but in a way that I'd never seen before. And I hope that that experience will be a little like the experience we have as we read and understand this chapter in the Old Testament. Because Jesus said, actually, the whole Old Testament is about him. In Luke 24, he was speaking to his disciples about the Old Testament scriptures, and this is what he said. Then he opened his ma my, their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus says the whole Old Testament is about him, and particularly about his suffering and death and resurrection and the forgiveness of sins that he brings. So when we read the Old Testament, we see Jesus. But not in the way we're used to seeing him in the New Testament. In the New Testament, he was here on earth with a human body acting and speaking. In the Old Testament, it's not like that. It's different. It's shadows and pictures and sketches of Jesus and his death on the cross. The great thing about that is that it allows us to see Jesus from different angles, still unmistakably him, but with fresh views that recapture our wonder in the cross and rekindle our love for it. That's what we're going to look at as we come to Esther chapter 7. But before we do, again, we need to catch up. We skipped a few chapters, haven't we? So we need to catch up with the story. At the end of chapter 4, where we finished this morning, we were on a bit of a cliffhanger. Haman, do you remember Haman? He had plotted this mass genocide of the Jewish nation, and Queen Esther had just decided that she was going to go in and um, ask the king to save the Jewish people. And so that's what she did. After three days of fasting and praying, with her heart in her mouth, she went into the king's chamber. And he saw her through the doorway, and she found favor in his sight. He extended his golden scepter, and she goes into the throne room. And the king says to her, what can I do for you, Esther? Whatever it is, it will be granted to you. Esther is wise and careful. She wants to pick her moment. And so she says, oh, king, will you and Haman come to a private feast, a banquet that I'm going to have later today? Don't mind if I do, says the king. And they go to this banquet. And when they're there, the king asks again, what is it that you want? Whatever it is, it will be given to you. And again, Esther says, oh, king, would you and Haman come to another private banquet tomorrow that I'm going to have? Don't mind if I do, says the king. And Haman goes home that night on top of the world. He thinks he's in absolutely the king and the queen's good books. The only thing spoiling his happiness is Mordecai, who still won't bow down before him. And so what he does is goes and complains to his wife about it. And his wife says, here's an idea. Build a gallows, sent 75 foot tall, and tomorrow morning go to the king and ask for permission to hang Mordecai on it. Haman thinks that's a great idea, so he has this gallows built, and he goes to bed ready to speak to the king the next day. Meanwhile, King Ahasuerus can't sleep. And he does what I think lots of us do in that situation. He tries to find something very boring to read. And so he thinks, I know a government report, that will send me right off. So he gets his advisors to read to him from the chronicle of his reign. And they just happened to bring in the book that talked about how five years previously, Mordecai had saved the king's life. There had been a plot against the king, and Mordecai had discovered it and reported it, and the king's life had been saved. And so the king says, what did we do to honor Mordecai for saving my life? And the officials say, oh, nothing. We didn't, you know, we didn't do anything. The king says, that's not right. Which of my advisors is in the court? Have them come in and we'll, we'll see what we should do to honor Mordecai. They say, oh, Haman just happens to have come in. And that's right. 
Let's go back one, back one. Yeah, perfect. That's right. Haman has just come into the court to ask permission to kill Mordecai. He comes in, and before he gets to the bit about the gallows, before he has a chance to say it, the king says, what should we do for the man that the king delights to honor? Haman thinks, who could he be talking about? And so he goes into great detail of all the things that should be done for this man that the king delights to honor. And then the king says, go and do it for Mordecai. And Haman is horrified. It's a terrible moment for him. But he has to comply. He doesn't mention the gallows. He has to go and do for Mordecai what he himself has suggested. And so that is where we come to at the beginning of chapter 7. It's the second day. It's the second feast. Um, What is going to happen next? Well, let's find out. First one, we're going to read the whole chapter. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, Let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. Well, it's a very dramatic story, isn't it? So let's go back to the start and look at it together. In verse 1, the king and Haman and Esther get together for their feast. And in verse 2, they're drinking their wine. And the king says to Esther, what is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. I think at this stage, his curiosity must be fit to burst, mustn't it? What is it that she wants? He knows it must be very serious because she was willing to come into his throne room at the risk of her life. And he shows that he has favorably disposed her. Three times now, he has said in public, I'll give you whatever it is that you want. So now is her moment. And so in verse three, she makes her request. O oh, king, grant me my life. Spare my people from death. And in verse 4, she quotes the exact words from Haman's decree. We've been sold to be destroyed, killed, annihilated. What a shock this is to the king. Do you remember, he doesn't even know that Esther is Jewish at this stage. It's a total bolt from the blue. And I think if this is a film, this would be the moment where we get a close-up on Haman's face as the beads of sweat begin to break out on his brow. Because in verse five, the king splutters into life. He's totally indignant. Who is he? 
Where is he who would dare to do this against my queen? A very tense moment. And Esther points the finger, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. And it is a knockout blow for Haman. He is absolutely petrified, cringing in terror before her. King storms out in fury into the garden and he's left alone with the queen. And it's a tricky moment for him because it's actually, it was illegal for him to be alone with the, with the king's wife. But he can hardly go into the garden and follow the king, can he? So he does the only thing that he can think of. He, he falls down and begs for his life. And it's almost like a sort of sitcom moment, the timing of it, isn't it? Just at that moment when he's falling down, the king come back, comes back in, misreads the situation and says, are you even molesting the queen in my own house? And that is game over for Haman. As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered his face. His fate is sealed. And the only question now is how he will be executed. And at that moment, one of the king's officials pipes up rather helpfully and says, you might be interested to know, <laughs> as a 75-foot gallows just outside his house and just out of interest, he was going to kill Mordecai on it, the one who saved your life. And the king says, hang him on it. And the chapter ends there in verse 10. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. And how the tables have turned for Mordecai. Just 24 hours earlier, he was on top of the world, wasn't he? His plans going ahead in great favor with the king and queen, boasting to his wife and, his, and her friends. And now he is being executed in disgrace, hung up there for everybody to see. Now, before we come to the application of this and particularly think about how it points to Jesus... I want to ask you a question. I want you to travel back through time with me, back to the 5th century, and I want you to stand with me outside the city of Susa, by the river that flowed alongside, and I want you to look back at the citadel there on the hill, and I want to ask you, what do you see? Now remember, this is the age before high-rise buildings. Most, I think the tallest buildings would have been about two stories high, about 35, 40 feet, the same as the city wall. So what do you see as you look back to the citadel? Is anyone brave enough to shout out what they see? Yeah, the gallows, absolutely right. That would be the first thing that you saw as you look back at the skyline. If, like me, maybe 75 feet doesn't really mean that much to you, I've got a picture um, to show you just how tall this gallows was. So here is a... Um, average woman. This is to scale. There's the woman. Here are the city walls. And this is the gallows. It's ridiculously high, isn't it? It absolutely dominates the skyline. And actually, it is extremely significant in the book of Esther as a whole. The word for gallows is repeated again and again in the book of Esther. And so I want us to look a little bit more closely at it and get a bit technical. Now, this is the point. If your lunch is sitting rather heavily at the bottom of your stomach, just to sit up again and gear your brain, get your brain in gear, because this is something we can all understand. When you want to understand what a word in the Old Testament means, there are two things that you can look at. One of them is the original Hebrew manuscripts that was originally written. And the other thing is the Greek translation of that Hebrew, which is what they actually used in Jesus' day. This was the Old Testament they read in the time of Jesus in Greek. And so um, when we look at those texts, we see that the word which in English is translated as gallows is, in Hebrew, eights, and in Greek, xulon. And when we look at those Greek and Hebrew words, what we find is that actually it's not describing a gallows in the sense that we would maybe think of today with maybe a noose. Actually, that word, eights and zulon, at its most simple, just means tree. The word means tree. Now, in this context, it's obviously describing some kind of wooden pole or stake 
um, that was used to kill an individual. Now, the reason I wanted to go into all that and the reason it's significant is because when we search in the New Testament for exactly the same word, xulon in the Greek, you probably guessed it, what we find is that that word is used again and again to talk about the cross. And I've just got some examples up on the screen. Have a look. Acts chapter 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed, by hanging him on a tree. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. In each case, it is exactly the same word as the one that we get here in Esther 7. The gallows shows us the cross. And so here it is, at the end of our chapter, as we look at Haman there hanging above the city on a wooden instrument of torture, suddenly we are face to face with the cross. But you might be thinking, hang on a minute, I think we're moving a bit too fast. You know, I... Haman surely doesn't represent our Lord Jesus. Jesus is the perfect saviour who died for his people. That's not at all who Haman is, is it? And you're right. So who does Haman represent? What does Haman stand for? Well, to answer that question, what we want to do is look at the book of Esther as a whole and see how is Haman described. And again and again, we find there's a kind of nickname given to Haman in the book of Esther. And I put them up on the screen. Maybe the font, can you read that? Let me read that for us now. So, Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews. And in our chapter from today, from the lips of Esther, a foe and enemy, this wicked Haman. You can't really miss it, can you? Haman is the enemy of the Jews. That means he represents everything that stood against them, everything that condemned them. That is who Haman is. And so at the end of this chapter as we see Haman hung up there on the gallows, what we're seeing is everything that stood against the people of God completely defeated and destroyed. And that is exactly what happened at the cross, isn't it? Do you remember 1 Peter 2.24? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. All that stood against Christians, our sin, our guilt, the punishment that we deserve, all of that was rolled into one and put onto Jesus when he died on the cross. Christians can say, Christ became sin for us. He took our sin, he took it to the cross and he paid for it. And so if you're a Christian, everything that once stood against you is gone. (laughs) It has been taken by Jesus and it hangs up there on the cross for everyone to see. And to help us feel again the wonder of this truth, I want to ask you to imagine being a Jew in Susa back then while all this was happening. A few weeks earlier, you were just going about your normal business when you saw some posters start to be put up around the city. So you thought, I don't know, maybe someone's lost their cat or something. You went over to have a look. And what you saw chilled you to the bone. Haman's decree, signed with the king's stamp, saying that you and your children and your parents and everyone you love is going to be destroyed. The the most powerful official in the land stands against you and your people. What can you do? 
You run home, you tear your clothes, you weep through the night, and you pray. You fast and you pray that maybe Queen Esther will be able to stop Haman's wickedness. And then, two, maybe three days later, you come out into the square and there's something new. Dominating the skyline, an enormous gallows, and on the top hangs a man. Who is it? You strain your eyes, you begin to go towards it, but before you can even get there, the shout reaches your ears. Haman! Haman is dead! Haman hangs on the gallows for everyone to see. All that stood against you, all that condemned you, completely defeated and destroyed. And in the days ahead, if ever you get a flashback to that time of fear, wherever you are, all you need to do is look up and see that gallows and know that your enemy has been destroyed and you are totally safe and secure. And that is what Christians can do with the cross. Wherever they are, in their mind's eye, they can look up and see all that stood against them, defeated and destroyed. And they can delight. <laughs> That's actually the title of this talk, Delight in the Cross. And for me, as I've been looking at this chapter, and particularly at verse 10, Haman hanging on the gallows, I have felt again the wonder of the cross. To think that at the cross, Everything that stood against me has been taken away and dealt with. That is wonderfully liberating. And to find it here in this slightly unexpected place, in the death of Haman of all people, has been exciting. To see from a fresh angle what Jesus was doing when he died on the cross. It has rekindled my love and helped me to wonder again at the liberation that I have because of Jesus' death. And I've been praying that this will be a particular help to anyone who's here today feeling a real burden of sin. It may be that you've come here today and you perhaps um, there's a specific sin that you've been struggling with for many years, maybe that you've given again into again recently. It may be that nobody else knows about it, but you do and it's weighing on your heart, and it makes you feel you want to just run away from God and hide. Well, this is a wonderful chapter for you to hear today, to be able to look up and see all that stands against you on Jesus. Dealt with, defeated, and destroyed. What a reason that is to repent, to come back to the cross, not to run away from God, but to run back towards him. We started this afternoon with the question, what should we do when our love grows cold? And I hope we've seen today in practice that the answer is always to look more deeply at Jesus and his death on the cross. Not to find other new exciting things to keep our interest in Jesus but to look more deeply at the things that we know and to see Jesus and his death on the cross from new angles that help our hearts to be touched again with the beauty of what he has done. Because there is always more depth than we know in Jesus and his cross. J.C. Rowell, who we started with, he said this, he said, when ministers have preached Jesus all their lives, the half of his excellence will remain untold. When hearers see him face to face in the day of his appearing, they will find there was more in him than their hearts ever conceived. And what we've done today is to look through the lens of Esther 7 at the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross. And I pray that this angle will stick in our mind. I think it's a very memorable one, don't you? That in the weeks ahead, we will remember Haman there on the gallows and delight again in the view that he gives us of the cross. But I pray 
larger than that. This will be the bigger desire of our whole lives. Every year, we will want to look more deeply at the Lord Jesus and that our love for him will be kindled afresh as we see more of who he is and what he has done. Well, as I finish, I want to read a few words of a famous hymn, which I think captures something of what we've seen today. So let me finish with this. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Let me pray as we finish. Dear Father God, we thank you so much for the joy of this passage, for the truth that all that stood against us, all that condemned us, has been totally defeated and destroyed, rolled onto Jesus and paid for by him. And I pray for each one of our hearts that you would stir them up afresh to love the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross. For those who have become a bit over familiar with the cross, this would help them to remember again how wonderful it is. And for those who feel burdened by sin and guilt, that they would run back to the cross and delight again to see that sin taken away and dealt with. I pray that for all of us, this would be the the theme of our lives. Each year, we would love the Lord Jesus more as we look more deeply into his work on the cross. I thank you that we won't get to the bottom of it before he comes again or before we go to see him face to face. What a joy that is to be those who know and love him. In his name we pray. Amen.